So good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, please? That's where I want to begin this morning. We're trying. And I certainly appreciate you being here this morning. As I look over the parking lot this morning and I see all the cars and I see all the people that are, are, are doing their very best to serve the Lord and to worship our God. And together this morning, it, uh, it warms my heart. And I have to tell you, I'm reminded that I'm certainly not alone. But we have a whole host of brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ who, who love God and who love me. And uh, that's a real blessing. And I'm really glad to see you this morning. We do have guests, and we appreciate very much you coming to be with us this morning as well. Philippians chapter 1, I want to begin reading at verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, begin reading with me at verse 27. Only conduct yourselves, Paul says, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and this too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in me, but also to suffer on his behalf, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, Paul goes on to say, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. Consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, which is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are on heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. And then we get to verse 12. There's a so thin there that likens back to what we just read. And I'm convinced the passage that we just read, we could read it every week. And it would be most appropriate and relevant for us. But look at the so then in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Paul, here led by the Holy Spirit, he tells us to work out your own salvation. Salvation. That's what it's all about, brethren. I would argue that's ultimately why we're all here this morning. Salvation. You know, when we talk about salvation in Scripture, it's used in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it, it speaks of that moment when a person gives their lives to Christ in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of their sins. It was Jesus who would say in Mark chapter 16 at verse 16, the one who has believed and has been baptized will be saved, but the one who's not believed will be condemned. Other times, when we talk about salvation, it deals and is presented as an ongoing process, as, as what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 18, where the apostle Paul would say, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then at other times, we see salvation used in the sense of our future as salvation that will come when, when Jesus ultimately returns. We looked at 1 Peter chapter 1 a couple of weeks ago. And there in verse 5, blessed be, or verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain inheritance, which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven uh, for you. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So as you can see in scripture, when we talk about salvation, it's used in a few different ways. So with an understanding of how salvation is referenced in scripture, it makes perfect sense here what Paul says here in Philippians chapter 2 at verse 12, where he says to work out your own salvation. In other words, it's an ongoing process. It's a daily working out. It's preparation that takes place daily by way of preparing for where we will spend eternity. I want to break down this morning verses 12 and 13, and I want to make some observations that I think are truly most relevant to us right here and right now. Number one, I want us to appreciate from this passage the fact that there is a level of independence that we need to accept by way of working our salvation out. If you go back to verse 12 there in Philippians chapter 2, notice what Paul says. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, don't miss that. It's obedience, Paul says. Not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Listen to what Paul says. Work out your own salvation. That's personal. You know, brethren, we talk much about our relationships one with another. We emphasize much our responsibilities one to another. And that's appropriate. The Bible is filled with those one another passages. Love one another. Submit to one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another. And we could go on and on and on by way of all the one another's. And we emphasize those one another's for good reason. We need one another. And we're going to give an account as to how we've handled our relationships one to another. We talk about the body of Christ. The household of God, as Paul would describe. And we cherish our relationships one with another. But I think Paul here brings up something that we also need to consider. While not minimizing our relationships one to another, brethren, we need to accept the truth, the idea that at the end of the day, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our walk with God, when it comes to our spiritual growth or lack thereof, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for me and you're responsible for you. I have a responsibility to grow. I have a responsibility to increase my faith through a study of God's word. I'm responsible for me. I need to grow to a point in my walk with Christ that I have the ability to stand on my own in my relationship with Jesus. I need to take the initiative. I need to focus on my relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to get to a point in my walk with God that I'm not totally dependent upon others. You would agree with that. Paul says, work out your own salvation. Now, again, that's not to minimize our relationships one to another. Not to minimize our need for one another. Not to minimize our responsibilities one to another. But Paul says here, work out your own salvation. You know, Paul, he did a lot for his brethren. He sacrificed much for his brethren. He loved his brothers and sisters in Christ much. But even Paul recognized he couldn't do it for them. The elders at Philippi sure did a lot 
for the brethren there. But they didn't, could, couldn't do it for them. And brethren, in the same way, while our elders can help, while they play a major role in watching for our souls, leading us, guiding us, protecting us, while the preacher can help, while Bible class teachers can help, while older brethren must help, at the end of the day, at some point, I've got to accept the fact that I'm responsible for me. You know, too often, we take spiritual inventory of our lives, and we're not where we want to be. We've not grown like we should. And we want to know why. You know, it's easy to blame others. It's easy to blame the elders. Easy to blame the evangelists. Easy to blame our brothers and sisters in Christ. And maybe you're here this morning and you're not where you want to be. Listen, there's a lot of excuses right now. Let me encourage you. Encourage me. Take initiative. You pick up your Bible in the morning. You spend time in God's Word. You make faith a priority. You, me, Paul says, work out your own salvation. And I think that's a good reminder for us right now. But I want us to emphasize and appreciate this morning, there's a how in this. If you go back to the text there in Philippians chapter 2 at verse 12, Paul says, So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Listen to how Paul phrases this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear is a prominent theme of Scripture. I like to think of fear as that two-sided coin that, that deals with one's view of God. Certainly there's a reverential awe in light of who God is, in light of what he's capable of, in light of, of what he's done, in light of his marvelous and awesome grace. And certainly to fear God is to fear displeasing him. Not just in light of his wrath and his judgment, although that's certainly a part of it, but not wanting to disappoint our God in light of all that he's done for us, in light of what he's doing for us, and in light of, of what he'll do for us. But certainly, I hope that we get and understand that there are eternal consequences to disobedience, that we'll all give an account before a holy and just God that God is going to hold people accountable for their lives, their choices, how they've worked out their salvation. <clears throat> and we should fear and we should tremble at the idea of displeasing God as a result of who he is, as a result of his grace, his mercy in dealing with us in our sins. And certainly in light of his justice and divine wrath. But I think as I consider this idea of working out my salvation with fear and trembling. There's a word that comes to my mind that I think captures this idea. To work out my salvation with fear and trembling is to take my salvation where I'll spend eternity with a level of seriousness. Brethren, we need to be serious about our salvation. You know, brothers, too often, I, I believe we take the wrong things serious. You know, there are things in, in our life. Well, I'll just speak to me. I need to get some perspective about. It. There are some things in my life that I need to reevaluate and not take so seriously. But when it comes to my salvation. As the leader of my home, when it comes to my wife and my children's salvation, I need to take that 
most serious. Our salvation deserves a level of seriousness unlike anything else in our lives. Now that's easy to say. But do our, does our lives, our decisions, our priorities, is it reflected? I'm responsible for me. And you're responsible for you. I need to get serious about working out my salvation. And then there's this. God has not left us alone in this. We do a great service to verse 12 when we stop at verse 12. And don't couple it with verse 13. Look at verse 12 again starting. So then my beloved brethren, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now look at verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. God has not left us alone in this. Not left us to fend for ourselves. To read verse 12 without verse 13, I think, would be a, a depressing and hopeless venture. No serious Bible student would even attempt to argue that man's salvation is something man can do on his own, apart from God. Apart from his grace, apart from his mercy, his forgiveness, apart from his perfect mankind, plan for mankind, there would be no salvation. The wages of sin is death. We're sinners. And apart from God, that would be our destination, eternal death. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that man has no responsibility in his salvation. That man has no role. Or that man's response to God's grace is completely out of his control. Of course not. Verse 12 flies in, in the face of that. But here in verse 13, Paul tells us that God is working in us. To desire and, and to work for his good pleasure. Another way of saying that is God causes us to will to do his will. So the question becomes... How does God will us to do his will? Very quickly as we close, I want to give you a few ways I believe this happens. Through the word of God that is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Number one, God's divine love, I believe, wills us. To do his will. You know for the honest heart. For the reasonable heart. For the believer. The love of God. Is a most powerful. Driving force. Or it should be. John 3 at verse 16. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Think for a moment, most fundamental, what motivated our God to send his only begotten son to this world to die in the most horrific and brutal way possible? Not for his sins. What motivated that? His love. For us. Now you've heard that verse a million times. Every first day of the week, we partake of the Lord's Supper. And we're reminded of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has done for us. Every week we come together like this. And somewhere in our message, what God has done for us, it comes up. Let me ask you: does it still move you? Does it still change you? Does it still will you? 
It should. When we consider where we'd be without it, does it move you? You know, we quote it often because it's so powerful. But Romans chapter 5 at verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. And he died for me. Does that still move you? Does it still motivate you? You know, on the day of Pentecost, the, the most anticipated moment when the Lord's apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what did they preach? What did they proclaim? They preached, they proclaimed the love of God. And what effect did it have on those good and honest hearts? It pricked them. It pierced them. It moved their will. It transformed their thinking. They repented. They were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. What motivated that? The love of God. The love of God. The love of Christ. To the good and honest heart, it changes their will. It controls them. It compels them. It constrains them, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 14. The Apostle John would say in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19, we love because he first loved us. His loving us first changes us. It moves us, not only to love him, but in loving him, we love others. And we carry out his will and his way of serving and loving others, our fellow man. That rooted in our recognition of his perfect divine love for us. He goes on there in verse 20 and says, if someone says, I love God, and yet he hates his brother or sister, he's a lie. For the one who does not love his brother and sister, whom he has not seen, cannot love God, whom he's not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. I want to tell you, for the good. An honest heart. The love of God wills us to do his will. But consider this. How about this? The obvious evidence that God's way is best wills us to do his will. You see, fearing God is all about coming to the recognition of who God is. And what he's capable of. His omniscience. His omnipotence. His omnipresence. I'm convinced. As I believe you're convinced. That God's way is best. You believe that? You know right now we see. I believe man's way. It's crumbling all around us. We see the effects of unrighteousness in our communities. We see the destruction of the home right before our eyes. And all of that bears testimony that man's way, when man is left to himself, apart from God and his way, it's an absolute disaster, amen? And you know all of this is testimony that there's a better way, that God's way works. God's word presents a better way with better results for the here and now and certainly for the life to come. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, he says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdens. The recognition and belief that God's way is best, that God's way works, that keeping his commandments are for our good. That should will us to obedience. It should will us to do his will. The love of God wills us to do his will. The obvious, obvious evidence that God's way is best, it wills us to do his will. And then there's this. The reality of eternal punishment. It wills us to do his will. 
You know, hell is an unpleasant reality. But an acceptance of the reality of hell, outer darkness, as the Bible describes it, eternal separation from God, and all good things that ultimately originate from God, that should will us to do his will. I would argue this morning that a healthy fear of eternal punishment, that's a good thing. That's a healthy thing. Jesus often spoke of hell. He often spoke about preparation for the eternal, working out our salvation. He spoke of the separation that will take place on the day of judgment. He talked about the finality of death, a fixed chasm, leading one to consider their lives in light of eternity. While they still have breath, while they still have opportunity. You know, the sad reality is this, heaven won't be for everyone. Not because of God, but because of man and their choices. It will be, though, for the obedience. Obedience to the will of God in response to his grace and his mercy. It was Jesus who said in Matthew chapter 7 at verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Heaven won't be for everyone. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, the Bible says, For the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers, sexual and moral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire. And brimstone, which is the second death. Brethren, I want no part of hell. And I know you don't either. But it's real. The love of God wills us to do his will. The obvious evidence that God's way is best wills us to do his will. The reality of eternal punishment, it wills us to do his will. And then last. The glories of heaven. It wills us to do his will. Over the last couple of weeks from the word of God, I've implored us to think more about heaven. To think more about what lies ahead for the faithful. For those who do the will of God in response to his grace. To set our mind on things above Colossians chapter 3. And it's in scripture that God has revealed for us a place prepared for the faithful, a place of rest, cessation from hurt, from pain, from tears, from death, a place where there will be no sin, nor its consequences, eternal bliss. As Peter would say, as we've been talking about, 1 Peter chapter 1 at verse 4, an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and won't fade away. Heaven, it will be a place where we will enjoy complete fellowship with God. We will see our God, who he is. And for eternity, we will worship him. And we will delight in his presence. Heaven will be perfection, a place of beauty, of life, of service, worship, of glory. It will be perfection. And it will last forever. God has promised this. For the faithful. Brethren, I believe the love of God wills us to do his will. The obvious evidence that God's way is best. It wills us to do his will. The reality of eternal punishment. It wills us to do his will. The glories of heaven that await the faithful. It wills us to do his will. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace you've been saved. Through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Philippians 2 and verse 12. So then my beloved just as you've always obeyed. Not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God who is at work in you, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. Brother, let's do this. Let's fill our minds with the love of God. Let's fill our minds with his precious promises. Let's fill our minds with the reality of heaven, the reality of hell. Let's fill our minds with his will on a daily basis. And let's work out our salvation through a life of obedience in response to his marvelous grace. If you're here this morning and you are not right with God, I beg of you. While God is patient, while he is providing you an opportunity this very morning, consider your life in light of his grace, in light of his mercy. Consider where you would be this morning apart from his grace and his mercy. Sin separates man from God. To die in that state is to spend eternity apart from him. Eternal punishment in a place called hell. Accept the reality of that. For the faithful, accept his grace on his terms. To repent of their sins and are baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And dedicate their lives to a life of faithfulness. Working out their own salvation. Through the power that he gives us through his word. Heaven is the result. Are you ready? Why don't you come to Jesus this very morning on his terms? If you're outside your car, let's stand as we sing the invitation song. Parade 47, why not now?